Mati Bhakti Gurata Swami Tanamane Nam Oma Gana Timananda Sya Yananjana Salakaya Shaksur Militam Yena Tazma Shri Guru Vena Maha Shi Chaitanya Manobi Shtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamaya Dati Swa Padanti Kam Andeham Shi Guru Shi Uta Parakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Sha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sadvaitam Sabadutam Prajana Saitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan, Sahagana Lalita, Shri Vasakans Vitam Sha, E Krishna Karna Sindo, Tina Bando Dugatpate, Kopesha Kopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute, Tapta Kanchena Gorangi Radhe Brinda Vaneshwari, Krishu Bano Siddhadevi, Ranamami Hari Priye, Pancha Kapa Trubhya Kripa Sindhu Vibhacha, Patidanam Bhavani Yogi Vaishnavesha Vibhacha, Nitananda, Shedway to Gadad, Har Shiva, Sidi Gore, Bakhtamunda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Omnamo Bhagavate Vasu Devaya, Omnamo Bhagavate Vasu Devaya, Omnamo Bhagavate Vasu Devaya. So, Hare Krishna, everyone. You see, we have Spain, Orlando, and I guess Bulgaria, and Rishan was saying, are you calling from Texas? And we have here. Uh, Washington, D.C., in India. Is Krishna Mai there too, also? <laughs> and we have Australia. <laughs> and we have Romania. Oh, we have a nice. And you're in Germany? Bakin. Yassi, are you in Germany? Uh, no, hi, Krishna Maharaj. I am from Peru. Oh, Peru, okay. Peru. Jiva Tattva. You can't see your face, Jiva Tattva. You're hiding. So I'm going to read today and go Vinda Dasi's in Italy. We also have local guru is in Bulgaria. We have Peru. We have at least one. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, oh, Australia again. Melbourne. Yes. You'll be right. No worries. Yeah. Stage four lockdown now. <laughs> What's that? Just went into stage four lockdown now. Tonight. Oh, okay. What's the highest? Oh, I don't know. They just make it up as they go along. <laughs> yeah. From Nether from uh, Radadesh or Nether or Belgium. Mm. Hare Krishna. So I'm going to read from the Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter eighteen, text number fifty seven. If you want to follow along, it's Bhagavad Gita eighteen fifty seven. Chaitasa Sarva Karmani Maya Sanyasya Matraha Uri Yoga Mupashitya Matsita Ksatatam Bhava and all activities depend upon me and work always under my protection. In such devotional service be fully conscious of me. Social Prize Purport. You can all, I'll read that translation again. In all activities, just depend upon me 
and work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. Prophet's mm. purport. When one acts in Krishna consciousness, he does not act as the master of the world. Just like a servant, one acts fully under the direction of the Supreme Lord. The servant has no individual independence. He acts only on the order of the master. The servant acting on behalf of the master is unaffected by profit and loss. He simply discharges the, his duty faithfully in terms of the order of the Lord. Now, one may argue that Arjuna was acting under the personal direction of Krishna. From Jivatattva Das, he's trying to locate something. Trying to locate the sound button. Does anyone know where his sound button is? Can you help him, uh, Kumari da Dasi? Yes, Guru Maharaj, I'll try to do it. So one acts according to the direction of Krishna in this book, as well as under the guidance of the representative of Krishna, then the result will be the same. The Sanskrit word madparaha in this verse is very important. It indicates that one has no goal in life, save and accept, act in Krishna consciousness, just to satisfy Krishna. And while working that way, one should think of Krishna only. I've been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna. While acting in such a way, one naturally has to think of Krishna. This is perfect Krishna consciousness. That's, hmm. One should however note that after doing something whimsically, he should not offer the result to the Supreme Lord. That sort of duty is not in devotional service of Krishna consciousness. One should act according to the order of Krishna. This is a very important point. That order of Krishna comes through the super succession from the bona fide spiritual master. So if one gets a bona fide spiritual master and acts according to his direction, then one's success in life in Krishna consciousness is guaranteed. That's perfect. So Chaitanya Sarva Karmani, Maya Sanyasya Mataraha, Udi Yogamu Pashitya, Masita Sadatam Bhava. In all activities depend upon me, work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. Mahavishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthai Buddha, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swani Tanamane, Namaste Sarasatunde Ve, Goravani Vacharane, Nirvishesha Shinivadi, Paskatya De Satarane. So good morning, everyone, and good evening, everyone. Some, some is evening, some is morning, some is in between. I think, what time is it in uh, Australia? Uh, 10 past 9 nine. p.m. 9 p.m. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 10 past, 10 past 9, yeah. 10 past 9, okay. You're in the same time zone as... Uh, is it Melbourne? Sydney's the same time. Oh, good. All right. This verse is very, makes Krishna consciousness very simple. That, as we know, Krishna consciousness is in three stages known as Sambandha, Abhideya, and Prayojana. And sometimes there's a lot of philosophy to explain these different stages. But this particular verse makes it quite simple. That Sambandha means to simply accept that everything here belongs to Krishna. If we accept that, then we've understood the Sambandha, namely that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, basically speaking, there's three aspects to that. Number one, that everything belongs to Krishna and Krishna is the enjoyer. So that's the next stage, that not only I think everything is, belongs to Krishna, but everything is meant for Krishna's service. So this is the next stage. To find out what Krishna wants us to do with his energy, we have to inquire. And the inquiry comes from Guru, and from Sadhu, and from Shastra. 
Now, if everything belongs to Krishna, and why does everything belong to Krishna? For, for one reason, is that Krishna happens to be in everyone's heart. If you check right now and you look deeply, you can actually see him. As far as I can see, he's waving to everyone. Since Krishna is in everyone's heart, therefore he's giving us all remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Not only that, but he was the one who provided the material energy for us so that we can do, we can fulfill our desires here. So in a very real sense, Krishna is the proprietor. And in a real sense, we're all under Krishna's direction. Now, if we accept Krishna as a proprietor, then we have to inquire from Krishna, what would he like us to do? Now, Krishna is not trying to make it a secret. We may think, well, this is pretty difficult. What does Krishna want me to do? All right, Krishna, what do you want me to do? I'm listening. I can't hear you. Can you speak a little louder? Still can't hear you. Maybe I need, maybe I need a, maybe Krishna needs a microphone so we can hear him. Maybe I, I, I need some hearing aid or something. No, Krishna is not trying to make it a secret what he wants us to do, but we have to be inquisitive. So therefore we've learned tadvidi prani patena pari prashnena sevya upadekshanti te jnanam jnanas tatvadarshanaha that there are three aspects of spiritual life. Namely, surrender, submission, and surrender. Because without submission and surrender, we're all submissive and surrendered to something. As Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, if we're not submissive and surrendered to Krishna's instructions, then Maya will dictate to us. Maya is standing right by us. She's our dear most friend. And Krishna Bahir Mukha Bhagavan Shatare, Ikatista Tare, Japatiya Dare. And she's always ready to put us in Maya. She's always inviting us, please come so I can kick you. And we say, Yes, Maya, I'm ready to be kicked. You know, can you kick me here? No, I think I'll kick you over there. So Maya is always ready to attract us and kick us as hard as we want. So Prabhupada writes, this is acting whimsically. That as soon as we don't think about what Krishna wants us to do, then our activities will become whimsical. As Krishna says in the, in the 16th chapter, Yakshastra vidim utsrija vartate kama karata that one who acts, doesn't act according to Shastra and follows his, and acts whimsically can attain neither peace nor happiness nor the supreme destination. So that whimsically means act according to lust, anger, and greed. Trividam narakasedam, dvaram nashitam atmanaha, kama krota tatalo vas tasmat etam trayam chejai. There are three gates leading to hell, in case you want to see Yamaraj. There's a path is wide open. There is a gate. You just have to open that gate, and you can walk through. And Yamaraj and the Yamadudas will <laughs> give you a nice greeting. Namely, lust, anger, and greed. So every sane man should become free from these three gates, because they lead to the degradation of the self or the soul. So whimsically means as soon as we forget that we're Krishna's servants, as soon as we believe that this material nature is here for my happiness, then we're under the subject, we're under the laws of material energy. But when we accept everything belongs to Krishna and we develop a desire to utilize Krishna's energies in Krishna's service, then Krishna gives us Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. Now, this is a very important point because Guru will inspire us, hopefully, and direct us how we can cooperate, how to understand Shastra and how to serve Sadhu. As I've said many times, 
Guru doesn't stand alone. Uh, the principle of Guru is that the Guru is, to the best of his ability, representing Krishna and trying to give vision to the disciple so they can see everyone and everything else in relation to Krishna. If we think Guru is, Krishna is only in the heart of Guru, and somehow or another, everyone else has an empty heart, that we're wondering how they're still alive because there's nothing in their heart, then we're wrong. Actually, Krishna is in everyone's heart. And what everyone can say, anyone on any level of devotional service, all depends upon Krishna. The best we can do is repeat Krishna's message and follow Krishna's instructions. But that pertains to everyone. So Guru teaches us, any Guru, Shiksha Diksha Guru, teaches us how to serve not only Krishna, but also Krishna's devotees. And not only to serve Krishna's devotees, but also to serve the innocent people, because they're also part of Krishna's family. They've just forgotten. And not only how to serve the innocent people and the devotees and Krishna, but even those who are against Krishna, we should serve them by neglecting them. We should not encourage them. We should simply try to ignore them. Or if the occasion is there, then we could try to defeat them by arguments. Uh, generally speaking, that's when other people are present and we're being challenged. And rather than, than ignore those who are atheistic or against Krishna, we can defeat their arguments with logic and reasoning, if we're capable of doing that. So serving Krishna means to also serve Krishna's devotees. That means also, if we try to please the devotee and the devotee is pleased, then Krishna will be pleased. If we sincerely try to please the spiritual master and follow his instructions, part of those instructions of how to please the other devotees also, how to see them appropriately. Those who are more advanced than us, those who are more steady and more enthusiastic in some way in devotional service, we should try to serve them also if we want to advance in devotional service. And for those who are on the same level of us as we are, then we should try to cooperate with them, specifically so that we can mutually inspire each other to make spiritual advancement, we can learn from each other, and cooperate to help the innocent, and to avoid the atheists. We do this under the guidance of superior devotees by their example and instructions. We learn how to cooperate with each other and we learn how to help the innocent and avoid the atheists. So many times we don't know what the answer is. We don't know what Krishna wants us to do. Therefore our first business is Amaritvam, Adambitvam, Ahimsa, Shanti, Arjavam, Acharya Pasadam Socham Stiriam Atma Vinigra. Our first business is to become humble. Now this is quite difficult because we have so many good, we, we're such good people. And we have so many assets. And we've done so many wonderful things. And everyone loves us. How can we be so humble? Yes, I can try to be humble, but I know it's artificial, but for my devotees, I try to set a good example. Now, actually, we should be humble, as Prabhupada wants to explain, that, yes, yeah, some of us are more advanced in some ways than others, but compared to Krishna, all of us are quite insignificant. Krishna, who showed in his mouth all the universes to his mother, Desoda, Twice. And Krishna said, all these universes, of course, only one universe was explained that Mother DeSoto saw all the planets in Krishna's mouth, and she saw all the uh, demigods, she saw Brahma sitting on a lotus flower, she saw earth and water and fire and air, and she saw herself with Krishna. And she saw a little bit of dirt in Krishna's mouth also. So that Krishna 
who in his mouth can show all the universes, explains that this is just a fraction of his energy. So compared to him, how can we become proud? So humility is the first qualification. Because if we realize that not right now we don't know who we are, we don't know who anyone else really is. We don't really know what's going on. And not only that, but what we think is going on and we think who we are, it's all wrong. So that should make us a little humble. Now that humility should make us depressed. Oh, I'm, I'm rotten, I'm fallen, I'm no good. Everyone hates me. You know, I look myself in the mirror, I think you're a rascal. You're not the best rascal because you're not the best anything, but you're a rascal anyhow. No, that humility should make us inquisitive, that we should inquire, what does Krishna want me to do? I may be rotten and fallen, but I should do something for Krishna because that's my position. As Prabhupada was explaining when he was installing Rukmini Dwarkana in Los Angeles, in 1972, he was explaining, first of all, that there is one devotee, his name was Bamsidas Babaji, that he had a very intimate relationship with his deities, but then Prabhupada decided to talk about Sanatana Goswami. Sanatana Goswami, he was doing madhakara, he was beggaring for some rotis in Vrindavan at that time, some pieces of half-cooked roti or bread, and he'd get them and he'd offer them to Madan Mohan. Madan Mohan was living in the house of a Brahmin, and that Brahmin, he had a dream that some mendicant would come and he should offer the deity to that mendicant. The Brahmin had a very intimate relationship with Madan Mohan, because Madan Mohan was being treated as one of his children. And Madan Mohan and the Brahmin, oh, well, the Brahmin was so advanced and his children were so advanced that sometimes Madan Mohan would go out and play with his children, although he was a deity. When this Brahmin had the dream that Madan Mohan had requested that he donate him, namely Madan Mohan, to Sanatana Goswami, would appear the next day. The Brahman was very unhappy, but he could not deny Madan Mohan's request. Sanatana Goswami came by the next day and it was explained to him that Madan Mohan requested that he live with Sanatana Goswami wherever he was living. So Sanatana Goswami told Madan Mohan, I don't think this is a very good idea because right now I don't have a place for you you will be very uncomfortable. Madame Mohan said, no, no, I'm sure, you know, you're, you're a great devotee, I'm sure you can find something for me. So Sanatana Goswami said, all right, let's see what happens. So he brought Madame Mohan to his place where he's living because he was living underneath the tree. So he gave Madame Mohan a branch. So Madame Mohan was a little surprised, but he didn't complain right away. But as time went on, Sanatana Goswami, his only livelihood was begging. So he was begging one half-cooked piece of bread. In Vrindavan at that time, there was no lawyer bazaar. There were no sweet shops. There was a forest, and there were even tigers and other animals in the forest. So people didn't have a kitchen like we have nowadays. They would bake a fire, and they throw the, they make some, get some, dough, they get some flour, make it, add some water, make it into a ball, and then throw the ball into the fire. And half the ball would be cooked and half it would be raw. It wasn't exactly a Sunday feast or anything like that. Madame Sanatana Goswami would beg and he'd get one or two of these rotis, half cooked pieces of bread, and he'd offer them to Madame Mohan. So time went on, Madan Mohan was getting more and more disturbed. And one day he couldn't take it anymore. He said, Sanatana Goswami, 
He said, every day you're offering me this dry piece of bread, half cooked piece of bread. He said, can't you get a little salt on it also? Maybe you can get a, beg a little salt. I mean, things are bad, but I didn't think they'd get this bad. So Sanatana Goswami said, sorry. He said, I'm an old man, I can hardly move. And whatever I get, I offer to you. So please stop complaining. So Prabhupada said, well, Madan Mohan, he had to accept because the bhakti was offering. And then he said, but what is your value? And what is the value of the things that you have? Prabhupada was explaining. He said, it's actually nothing. He said, Krishna, kindly take. I'm rotten and I'm fallen. And then Prabhupada started to cry, but I brought this for you. Don't be puffed up, Prabhupada said. Always remember that you're dealing with Krishna. Thank you. And Prabhupada was crying at that time. So we would understand we're actually dealing with Krishna, not for five minutes or when we're in front of the deities. In our very homes, wherever we are in the street or outside the street, we're always dealing with Krishna. And so we should take the attitude, humbly inquire, what does Krishna want me to do? And how should I do it? How should I think? What should I say? What should I do? What should be my mood in serving Krishna? Then the result is that naturally Krishna will give us the intelligence to the, the next stage, which is that, as Prabhupada writes here, this word matparahara is very important in this verse, that one should have no goal in life save and accept, act in Krishna consciousness just to satisfy Krishna. In other words, if we accept everything is Krishna's and that we're also Krishna's, we're also Krishna's servant and everything belongs to Krishna and everything is meant for Krishna's servant and I should find out what Krishna wants me to do, whether it's obvious sometimes and sometimes it's not so obvious but trying to take shelter of the super soul through Guru Sadhana Shastra. I should do my service, but then I should do it in a certain mood. Namely, that I've been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna. We have to become convinced that this is what Krishna wants me to do by following the process, and then with conviction that I'm doing this to satisfy Krishna. Then what will be the result? That one will naturally think about Krishna. And this is perfect Krishna consciousness. This is the most we can hope for. In Vrindavan, everyone is always thinking about Krishna. They're not getting richer. They're not getting stronger. They're not getting learning more things. They're not getting more famous. They're not developing anything. They're just developing their love for Krishna. They're just developing their meditation for, on Krishna and doing service to please Krishna. And by doing that service to please Krishna, they're eternally in love with Krishna and always thinking about him. So this is our goal, not to become more famous or wealthier or stronger or live longer. Our goal in life is to understand how everyone and everything is related to Krishna, that we're all subordinate to Krishna, we're meant to serve Krishna, we're meant to find out what Krishna wants us to do, and then we should do that to please him. With a conviction that what I'm doing is what Krishna really wants me to do, and I'm really doing it just to please him. And then the result is that we'll think about Krishna in devotion. Krishna will give us the remembrance and reveal himself to us, so that we'll actually experience real Krishna consciousness. Then we'll not only be in ecstasy, but eventually we'll actually feel some loving feelings towards Krishna, and we'll be able to see everything clearly that Bhagavad Gita is not simply a theoretical book, it's actually an experience. Krishna consciousness is not meant for simply understanding our philosophy theoretically, it's meant to experience love for Krishna through the proper process. Then we'll always be happy. And we'll always, whatever we're doing, will be beneficial for ourselves and others. 
and it ends promise that our life will become successful. Now we can't expect if we don't do, if we're not following the process, uh, that we should offer the results to Krishna. Probably gives the example that a man is walking down the street with puff rice and the wind blows it away and then he shouts out very loudly, Govinda Bok. He offers the puff rice to Krishna as it flies into the air. Because he can't eat it, so let Krishna eat it somehow or another. If we don't follow the process, then we can't expect that Krishna is going to accept the results. And even if somehow or another artificially we're able to remember Krishna, but that remembrance of Krishna will not be in the devotional mood of Krishna consciousness. It's always nice to remember Krishna, but we should avoid remembering Krishna like Hansa, being afraid of Krishna. That I didn't do my duty, I'm afraid Krishna is going to take my a thunderbolt and hit me on the head with it. Uh, that kind of, kind of remembrance of Krishna is not very favorable. Although we may not be like Kansa, hopefully, and we may not be antagonistic, but we should also not blame Krishna for our circumstances or for la lack of results, etc., etc., because that's really not in Krishna consciousness. We have to have faith that Krishna is actually the controller and as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, that Arjuna was inquiring from Krishna that this material world doesn't appear to be a very nice place. So, unfortunately, Arjuna was not living in such a nice place as we are. So he asked Krishna, now, my, my dear Krishna, now, why did you create this, this horrible feature? What's wrong with you? You were a really nice person. We were friends. We were both on the chariot. And then suddenly you, you, you kind of, something strange happened to you. And you manifested this horrible form, Uga Rupo, this horrible feature. Did you have a bad night last night? Did you have a fight with some of your queens or something and now you're taking it out on me? What happened? What are you? What's happening? I mean, I never expected this from you. You were always such a nice person, but this side of you I've never saw it, I've never seen before. So Krishna says, Kalosmi Shaya Krit Pravido, Lokan Samaharti Miha Pravita, Itepi Twam Nabid Vishanti Sarve, Yevasti Tat Pratni Keshu Yoda. That time I am the destroyer of all the worlds, and I've come here to engage everyone except for you, the Pandavas, all sides, all sides in this war will both be, they'll all be killed. So we're living in Krishna's Uga Rupo. So we're expecting some nice, pleasant circumstances. Well, probably for most of us, that has been dissipated to a good degree. If you're wondering, you know, coronavirus and the lockdown, whatever else hasn't, lessen your enthusiasm for material existence, just wait. Things have, this is, they've gotten bad, but material world can show us even a worse side of itself. So Krishna told Arjuna, this is a horrible feature and this is time and it's coming here to kill everyone, including ourselves, by the way. That no one gets, no one gets out of this world alive. Of course, we're not going to die because we're eternal, but to live eternally in hell is not a good idea. Therefore, one should avoid doing things whimsically because the result will not be, in any case, Krishna's consciousness. If we don't follow the process of trying to understand how everything, even the things that I hold very dear and near to me, and even my own personal body that I think is mine or me, that these things belong to Krishna, and I have to meditate what Krishna wants me to do. Now, for most of us during lockdown, the most practical thing to do is to have a daily program. If we can't go to the temple, we can chant with the other devotees, 
then at least we should have a picture of Krishna and Guru and others. And we should chant in the morning, in the evening, we should chant Guru Vastaka or other prayers. And we should hear Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and offer something to the deity. If, if only the deity is a picture. Uh, Krishna is not a picture. Krishna can appear in any form. He appears in the holy name. He appears in, in the deity, whether the deity be made of wood or stone or metal or even painting, such as in a picture. Uh, this is Krishna. We may be looking at the picture wondering, you know, is this actually Krishna? And Krishna is looking at us wondering, when will this devotee ever wake up? So Krishna is there. The question is where we are. So we should try to be there with Krishna. As Prabhupada said, the art of Krishna consciousness is the art of focusing one's attention and then giving one's love to Krishna. So if we have a picture of Krishna, we have a deity of Krishna, we have Krishna in the form of the books, then we should worship these objects and put our attention on them. At least in a regulated way. If we can't do it all the time, at least in the morning and the evening, we should chant Hare Krishna with our family, if we have one. And we should hear Srimad Bhagavatam Bhagavad Gita and make some offering to the deity. So material life is never going to be perfect, perfectly happy, nor perfectly miserable. But we should make the best use of it to develop our Krishna consciousness so that our, our life actually becomes spiritually successful. And at the same time, we begin to see, as Prabhupada writes in the, in, in the Krishna book, that the whole world is full of Krishna singing, but everyone's hearing it in a different way. That everyone is dancing with Krishna, but those who are dancing following Krishna's steps, they're dancing the rasa dance. And those who are dancing imitating Krishna, they're dancing with Krishna's maya. So we have a choice, either dance in the rasa dance, of which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sankirtan movement is the rasa dance. In Harinam Sankirtan, even if we're having it in our home, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will come, because he likes when we hear in this age when we're chanting Hare Krishna. Matter of fact, the Panchatattva will come. Hopefully we have enough room for them in our house. And when they're there, Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Radha Krishna, Nahi Anya, when Shaitanya Mahaprabhu is there, then Radha and Krishna are there. And along with their associates, the whole, when the Panchatattva is there, then the six Goswamis are there, the Acharyas are there, Krishna's associates are there. So this is the Rasa dance. And if we focus our attention and we actually try to appreciate and feel Krishna's presence, then the result is that we'll enter into the Rasa dance. And if we don't do that, then we'll continue to dance in the Maya dance, in the imitation of the Rasa dance. So this is given to us, this very simple verse, and the very simple process of bhakti is given to us, uh, but it's very profound, and it takes some time to apply, understand it and apply it. Uh, as Prabhupada said, it's simple for the simple, so we have to gradually become simple as our heart becomes purified, and we become more and more attracted. Well, we try to understand the process to the best of our ability and become more and more attracted and determined to follow it. So I'll stop there for now. Any questions? Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can ask a question. That was your first question. Two questions you can, then. You can ask another question. <laughs> um, I was, we were reading this Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, and uh, there is this um, paragraph which says, Lord Baldev in Krishna Loka is Nityananda Prabhu. So, uh, like in the, uh, in the spiritual universe, like there are different planets. So one, three of them is uh, Dwarka, uh, Mathura, and Vrindavan. So this Krishna Loka is this Vrindavan uh, one. So then how Lord Balram is uh, Nityananda there? 
in this uh, Krishna Loka because he appeared here, you know, like he didn't appear in Vrindavan. I heard he appeared here. No, Vrindavan, Goloka Vrindavan has different realms. The lotus flower, which is in the top of all material and spiritual universes, has a section where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his pastimes are going on eternally. And of course, when Lord, Niti, when Lord Chaitanya is having his pastimes, then Lord Nityananda is also there in that realm of Goloka Vrindavan. Goloka Vrindavan is quite a big place. So you don't have to worry about where they all fit in. There are one spiritual universe, one spiritual planet is bigger than all the material universes put together. And there are unlimited spiritual uh, planets in the spiritual sky. And all of them together wouldn't equal the Loka Vrindavan. So there's plenty of room there. Matter of fact, it's infinite. But as I said, part of that Goloka Vrindavan has its place where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates are eternally doing Sankirtan there in separation from Radha and Krishna. And in that same planet, Goloka Vrindavan, Krishna has his realm where he's doing it. Mathura is there and Vrindavan is there and they're eternally having their pastimes. Now, outside of that, according to Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, there is another planet of Dwarka, a spiritual planet of Dwarka, a realm of Dwarka. And there's also a realm of Ayodhya, where Gob Kumar, he first he went to the Vaikuntha planets, but later on he went to Ayodhya and was with Lord Ramachandra and his associates there. And after some time he went to Dwarka where he, he was associating with Krishna and his associates there. But ultimately he went to his original home, which was Goloka Vrindavan. And there it, it mentions that when he arrived there, he, he arrived in Mathura and he had heard that Kangsa had imprisoned Vasudev in Devaki and that all the others were fleeing. So he decided to flee also. So he went to be part of that Goloka Vrindavan where Krishna was and inquired from those inhabitants there where Krishna was. And eventually he came and met Krishna there. Gopal. Is that all right? Did I answer your question, Krishna Mayan? My question? Uh, Nitya Seva, Dasi. <laughs> yeah. You sound doubtful. <laughs> I'll, it's okay. I'll try to read more. I mean, I did understand, and I guess I need to read, need to read more. Yeah, we should all read more. But it was okay. I mean, it was, it was okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Oh, one more question. I heard something. Are you okay, Gurudev? I'm okay. I can still speak. I know, but I was. I heard something, so I wanted to. Oh know no! I was. Well, I was walking along. I was going to a store to get something to drink and someone came from behind and hit and slapped me in the back of my neck. And I turned around and saw him and he was running away. So I, as my usual self, I ran after him. So he ran into a store. And then I, anyhow, the bottom line is that luckily he just ran out. He was probably, he was around six feet five, which is quite six feet six but my nature is I don't usually back down. <laughs> so luckily he ran away. So I, neither one of us really got hurt. <laughs> Krishnamai, asked, Krishnamai is asking, so you wanted to beat him up? <laughs> well, I wanted to call the police. I mean, I wasn't, I wanted the police, but anyhow, it's the way the police work. It doesn't work that way. You probably, you have to kill someone before the police come. And even then, they just come to pick up the body and take it away. <laughs> she has a question. But anyhow, I didn't really get hurt. <laughs> she has a question. Yes, Krishna I didn't have a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyone else have a question? 
Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes, this is Agni Hotra from Russia. Yes, Agni Hotra Das. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. I have uh, some question about membering Krishna. Uh, my friend, he uh, uh, practiced Krishna consciousness during 15, uh, 15 years. And um, now he has a problem with his heart and he need a difficult uh, heart surgery in, on his heart. Uh, and uh, he uh, has some stress, depression, and he now only can chant Hare Krishna, don't can concentrate and read Shiva Prabhupada books. And how uh, we can help devotees in this situation that uh, more concentrate uh, on Krishna? Well, we all have the same problem. I mean, ultimately, the material world means everyone has a heart disease. And believe it or not, we're all going to die. Sorry for the bad news. Uh, generally speaking, other people are going to die. And we think we're going to live here forever. But the point is, one person is leaving their body and we think, oh, this poor person, he's so unfortunate. He had to die. We don't realize that we also have to leave our body. So the good point we should tell these devotees that you're not going to die because you're eternal. And neither is your body going to die because it's already dead. You can't say something that's dead is going to die because it can't die, because it's already dead. Something that's dead can't die. So these bodies are already dead. You're in a, in a car. You can't say when you get out of the car, the car died. Anyhow, and you can get another car. But you didn't die, neither did the car die. So this is a misconception. And we're all subjected to this misconception. That's the nature of Maya. Your friend is subjected to it, and I'm subjected to it. Probably we're all subjected to it. And the anxiety we have to go through is very good because it may force us to become a little bit more sincere in taking shelter of Krishna. It's not bad that someone's in anxiety if they utilize it rightly. Otherwise, eventually they'll come, and they have to come to the point of surrendering to Krishna, especially if they're a devotee, because they have no choice. Material nature is not giving us any choice. Oh, my dear Krishna, please don't, you know, let me die, let me live longer. But the time will have to come that we have to live longer. Prabhupada on a morning walk, in Mayapur in 1975, 76, he mentioned that this whole, he was heard from an astrologer that there was going to be a war between Russia and, 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 well, between Pakistan and India, and that America and Russia, would, America would join on, on Pakistan's side and, and Russia would join on India's side, and that there would be a war. At least is what Prabhupada had heard. So he said in the morning walk, he started out with, this whole civilization, which is meant to keep people in darkness, will soon come to an end with the next war. And you can hear the door, you go, <gasps> Oh, my God, we were going to die. My Krishna. And there was a long conversation. What should we do, Prabhupada? You know, should we go to the farms or what, how should we, you know, how to save ourselves? Ultimately, Prabhupada said, I, you know, yes, go to the farm. That's a good idea, whatever. But ultimately, you have to understand whether you die today or you die in 20 years, you're going to have to die. Not that if I die in 20 years from now, it's going to be a good, happy death. And today, it's going to be a bad death. No, sooner or later, according to Krishna's arrangement and whatever we deserve, we have to leave this body and get to our next destination. So we prepare ourselves by chanting Prabhupada. So they said, Prabhupada, what should we do? What should we do? Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna. The typical response of a devotee. So that's a good response. We should chant Hare Krishna. Sincerely take shelter of Krishna. Then we'll make some advancement. And at least our next life, we'll be able to continue on with the process of devotional service. So the anxieties that due to misconceptions, our unwillingness to sh take shelter of Krishna sincerely. But 
it's painful and it's very disturbing and it'll increase until we actually take shelter of Krishna sincerely and then it'll go away. Thank you very much, Guru Mukharaj. Yes, he, he said that I understand that I, uh, in my mind, that I am not uh, this body, I am soul, but uh, I have stress, I have some distress. Yes, well, we're not distressed. And if we think we're, you know, so we should concentrate, all of us, we concentrate more on Krishna. And then even if externally there's stress, but we won't be identified with it. It's like if you're living on the, on the top of the ocean, one time Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and he had heard from his leaders there that the Krishna Balaram temple was almost ready to be opened. This is 1972 or something like that, 74 actually. And so Prabhupada said, oh, very good, you know, we can open it for Gorpranim and Prabhupada invited the prime minister and the, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh and all these ministers and dignitaries and invited all the devotees from all over the world to come to Vrindavan for the opening of the Krishna Balaram temple. So Prabhupada arrived in Vrindavan to see the, oversee the final construction of the temple. And when he arrived, he saw there was nothing. There was not even a wall. It was all just bags of cement and the foundation was just about laid. There are no walls, no ceilings, nothing was there. And Prabhupada became furious. And everywhere he looked, devotees were hiding because the fire coming out of Prabhupada's eyes was so strong that they were afraid they were, afraid they were going to get burnt to ashes. So that went on for some time. Prabhupada said, who's responsible for this? Who, you know? Prabhupada was obviously not very pleased. So this went on actually for a considerable amount of time and Prabhupada finally went to his quarters, which at least had a wall or two on them. And he sat down to do some service. And one devotee came in trembling because he was afraid Prabhupada might glance at him and burn him to ashes. When he came in, Prabhupada was completely calm and undisturbed, so he was quite surprised. So he asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, just a minute ago, you were ready to burn the whole place to ashes with your anger. But now you seem completely undisturbed. How is this possible? So Prabhupada said, a, a pure devotee, he's actually living like deep inside the ocean. On the surface of the ocean, there are so many waves. There's so much wind going on. There's so many aquatic beings diving and, and swimming in the, in the surface. So there seems to be quite a disturbance going on. But deep inside the ocean, there's nothing really happening. There's no disturbance whatsoever. Externally, a, devotee, a pure devotee may manifest a certain mood in order for service, but he always is living deep inside the ocean of Krishna consciousness, undisturbed by what's going on externally. So we have to encourage ourselves and we have to encourage others to dive deeper into the ocean of pure devotional service in any circumstance. The time of death is a time to con when we actually should wake up and realize we're not going to be here forever. All these so-called gains that I think I've gotten, all these so-called losses I'm afraid of, uh, these are all parts of the products of our illusory consciousness. So we have to give it up and dive deeper into the ocean of Krishna consciousness. And therefore, death is very beneficial for the devotee who's actually trying to make advancement. And even if the devotee is overwhelmed by the anxiety, still it's a great lesson. And hopefully even in the next lifetime that one will actually realize that this is time to get serious. My last lifetime, I was not so serious. It didn't turn out the way I wanted it to be. So now I should get serious in this lifetime. So there's no loss or diminution to a devotee. There may be some pain, but that pain and anxiety is a great friend if it helps us take shelter more of Krishna. Anything else? Good day. Yes. Hi, Krishna. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, many 
communities, temple communities, there'll be devotees who are married to someone who's not practicing devotional service as much as they are, you know, like um, for whatever reason. So, you know, Prabhupada talks about um, sitting down together and chanting in the evening and morning and evening. And so how do, how do these devotees um, apply that in their lives that, you know, they're, they're, um, they kind of have to, you know, that their partner's not on the same level spiritually as they are? Well, that's a, quite a complicated question. Yeah, I mean, probably ask. Yeah, and you give some guidance on. <laughs> There's so many possibilities. Better yeah. to ask the householders. <laughs> the the devotees who, who have had that problem or that challenge were able to meet it because there's no one answer. There's so many possibilities. Mm. If you, especially when you have children, then everything becomes even more complicated. Mm. Your life is complicated, but when you have children, life becomes multiply, multiple. The complications become multiplied. So, if you if you're a sannyasi, it's easy to leave your dog behind and say, "I renounce you." Especially if you have a friend you can give the dog to. But otherwise, material life is not so simple. Mm. As soon as you get married, you get so many responsibilities. And the best time to figure out what to do is before you get married. After you get married, as I mentioned, especially in Kali Yuga, it's like that. That one lady, one Madhaji, which is a true story, she was married to another devotee for 30 years. They had three children. And one day they decided to get married. So the Madhaji went to her, her mother and said, Mom, I think we finally decided to get married after 30 years. And her mother took her hand and said, are you sure he's the right man? <laughs> so we should know what we're doing before we get married, not afterwards. Otherwise, it becomes difficult. Not that I get married, I have three children, then I discover my wife doesn't like Krishna. You should probably have some communication before marriage rather than afterwards. But if that happens, then you should inquire from those who, have, who know your situation and can give you good advice on how to deal with it. Hmm. Prabhupada's he tolerated his wife. She was, you know, she was, she was a devotee also. But ultimately one day he said, tea or me, half jokingly. Or he, she thought it was a joke. And she, she chose the tea. Because there were, he was in his 50s. Or he, was, he wasn't a young man. And he already had made some arrangements for the, that his family would be uh, taken care of. But in any case, that's what Prabhupada did under those circumstances. But on the other hand, Prabhupada's sister, Pishama, known as Auntie, she, her husband was a drunkard. He didn't follow the principles, but she faithfully served him for many, many years. And after some time, his heart melted and he became a devotee also. He gave up his bad habits and became a devotee due to her devotion. All right, so I think we'll stop here and uh, look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. Hare Krishna, glorious Prabhupada, Hare. glorious your services. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Rasa, Rasa Vihari. Are you, are you in touch with your father? Yes, yes, every day. Oh, that's good. I spoke to him yesterday. Oh, really? Oh. Okay. Okay. Hare Krishna, glory to Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna.
Thank you, Kumari. You're welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. Thank you, Kumari.